A few months ago, Karen was gone, and uh, Jacob and I were sitting around, and we said, you know, we got a deep hunger for cheese fries and a blooming onion. Now, those are the centerpieces of the appetizer menu at the Outback Steakhouse, and it just so happens that we have an Outback Steakhouse over by our local mall. We both decided we weren't quite ready to eat in a room with other people uh, with the virus and so forth, so he got on his phone and he ordered all of that stuff we wanted on the phone. You know, it went right from his phone to there. I didn't, you know, it was quite a miracle. And then they had the, the app he was using. It, it said, now we'll let you know when your food's ready and you can come get it. And it took a little longer. You know, there was a moment where we thought, well, maybe they forgot about us. And, and then all of a sudden it's phone, you know, your food's ready, come get it. So I went in the, got in the car and I drove over to the Outback Steakhouse. But when I tried to go into the front of the mall, there was a police cruiser with the lights going and wouldn't let me in. So I went down to the next thing and kind of came in from the back of the restaurant. And when I parked and when I started to get out, there were three or four people out on the sidewalk. They said, the restaurant's closed. It's in lockdown. They're sheltering in place. Somebody's been shot in the mall and the shooter is, is running around. They haven't got the shooter. Now, I'm not proud of what I did next. I sat there and thought, it's unlikely that shooter wants anything to do with me. And I've already paid for this food. They've got the order. The food's been paid for. And I want my blooming onion and my cheese fries. So I got out of the car, went over to where it said takeout, and tried to get in. It was locked, so I banged on the door. And this guy comes to the door, and he says, buddy, you need to get out of here. We're in lockdown. We're sheltering in place. There's a shooting. The shooter is still at large. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go home. But I already paid for my cheese fries and my blooming onion. Can I get that? And he looked at me like I was an alien. He said, what's your name? I think he was going to report me. I said, my name is John Burns. He said, OK, stay right here. He went in and came right back with a sack of food. And he said, now get out of here. So I went back in the car. Well, you got to check your order right before you go. And so I opened it up, and it was not my food. But I thought, I think I'd be pressing my luck if I go back and knock on that door one more time. So I said, well, I'll eat somebody else's dinner. And I wove between the blue flashing lights, and I got back home, and that's what we did. I found out that somebody had been shot. He did not die, and they did catch the shooter. But it was worse this last week. On Thursday, somebody was shot dead in the food court of our local mall at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And that felt personal to me because I remember when Jacob and Joanna were young, when they were children, we would go over to the food court after church on Sunday and Carson was always sitting in there <laughs> eating and uh, Betty Thompson and all of her brood were in there running around and we'd run into different people. I ran into Emmanuel one time over there. A, a bunch of the church folks were in there eating. It was like an after church potluck dinner uh, in, in the food cart. And we'd let the kids run around. One of them wanted Taco Bell and one of them wanted McDonald's and somebody else wanted something. And they'd all run around and they'd get their food and they'd come back and we'd sit down and it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and now there's been a shooting in the food court at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I wondered, what's happened to our little neighborhood? What's happened to our local mall? What's happened to the beautiful life we experience here? When Zechariah wrote this prophecy, the people of Jerusalem were wondering the same thing. They had come back from exile, and they were really excited about that. But everything was such a mess when they got back to Jerusalem. It took them a long while to get going, and they got the foundation of the temple, and now they got the walls up. But they're wearing out. 
I don't know if you've ever had a project that you've had great enthusiasm for when you started it, but it started getting worse and worse and worse and more problematic and more difficult, and pretty soon you wanted to stop and quit and do forget it called the plumber or whatever. You just you get worn out with it. That's where they were. They had started and they got going, but now it's taken much longer. The, the recovery is not going well. Uh, And they're wondering, are we ever going to have that beautiful life that we once experienced, that we hoped we would experience again? And God sees their despondency. When you're despondent, when you're disappointed, when you're discouraged, God sees that. I promise you, God sees that. And God is trying to work out some ways to get you encouraged again, to get you emboldened again. God's sending some messages. God's on the way if God has not yet arrived. God sees our discouragement. He saw it here. And so he said to them, there is a way for us to have a beautiful life together again. You got to do four things. He says, you got to restore your relationship with me. And then you've got to restore your relationship with one another. And then you've got to restore your relationship to hope. You've let hope go. And then you've got to restore your relationship to work. I sort of wish he'd have put them in a different order, but that's the way he did it. Left work to the end. I'm going, yeah, 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 work. Oh, well. He says, first of all, if we're going to have that beautiful life, We need to be restored to one another, God to God's people. God said, I've already shown up. I I have come back to Jerusalem. I'm not sure what that means. I think it was felt like his presence was gone. I think they didn't have the temple and they weren't too concerned at first to rebuild it. And so there was a sense that God is not here. But God says, I'm back. I'm back in town. I'm right in the middle of the city. It is now going to be called the holy city again, the faithful city again. This is now going to be known as the mount of the living God. I am here. And I'm waiting on everybody else. (laughs) I'm waiting on the return of my people. Where are they? God says, it's more than I'm waiting. I'm jealous for them. Now there's a word, isn't it? We don't usually associate that with God. Uh, When I think of jealousy, I think of the emotion where we we want a relationship that somebody else has. Is that jealousy? I think it is. We want the same closeness to mom that sister has. We want that same affection from papa that he gives to brother. We we want the woman of our dreams to notice us and she's all wrapped up in this other goofball that will never make her happy. And we're jealous of that. We, we, we want somebody else's relationship. It can even be in friendship where we have an acquaintance that we want to be closer to, but they have this best friend that they spend all their time with. We're jealous of another person's relationship. And I don't like it when I feel jealousy. I'm always disappointed because it still comes on me every once in a while. Maybe you've outgrown it, but I still get twinges of it from time to time. And it makes me feel immature and petty and, and uh, I get discouraged. When am I ever going to grow up? You know, when is it ever going to change? And, and pettiness and vindictiveness and, and immaturity are not words we associate with God. So it can't be that God is saying that He's vindictive, he's petty, he's insecure. No, it says when God is jealous, that, jealous with a great wrath, it even says. That's not a great translation. The word wrath here, translated as wrath, it means fire. It means fire. It, it means God's got a fever <laughs> for the people of Israel. God has a burning desire to get back together. God's got a passionate desire to be with the people of Jerusalem once again. And God said, I've done my part. I showed up. I'm here. It's it's like God's the the father and the prodigal son standing out in the the vestibule, the foyer every Sunday, (laughs) where God's down here by the communion table waiting on the church to return. God says, I am where I'm supposed to be. Where are you? we got to restore our relationship for the beautiful life to come. Uh, 
And, and how, how, do, how does that happen? Well, it happens when we prioritize God again. Uh, you know, I used to think the word priority was like a to-do list. Like, what are your priorities today? Well, I have to mow the yard and pay the bills, take a nap, <laughs> whatever it is. I, 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 I've got to see my favorite show. I've got to call my mother. you got these little to-do lists. But priorities are deeper than that. Priorities are are what get us up in the morning. It, it's those center themes of our lives that makes us in, in, invest in things that affects our mood. You know, a, a baseball fanatic, I, I don't know if we have any here, but a baseball fanatic, they will think, live, and breathe baseball. They're, they're watching the games, they're reading the reports, they're getting their stats. Uh, and you can stop them any time and say, well, how is so-and-so doing? Well, he went two for three last night. Or how, well, they're in third place, they're four games out. How's your favorite team? Uh, and when, when a baseball fanatic's favorite team wins, their mood, woo good day. When they lose, uh, and there's a little depression. <laughs> <laughs> That's a priority. That, that baseball is a priority. It affects everything in a person's life if that's what they center on. Some people do that with their investments. You, you know, they have investments. They had a little extra money. They put it in the Dow or the NASDAQ or whatever else those things are, and, and they get those, those readings. It comes right in on their computer. They used to have to open up the paper and look through all the numbers, but now it just comes right at them, right on their phone. Uh, it's up, it's down, it's sideways, uh, and, and, it, and if things are going well, whoa, they got some energy for life that day. But if things are on a downward turn, oh, woe is me, everything's dismal. That's what I'm talking about with a priority. It's where it affects you. It's where you think about it. It's where you commit to it. That's the priority. Does the decimation of the church affect you, see? Do you have a, a sad feeling when you look around and say, when are folks going to return when it struggles? Do, do you, does it affect you? Do you want to see it rise up again? Do you, you care about it? Do, do you pray about it? Do you invest in it? And, and not just the church, but the entire work of God. God says, come back to me. Make me a priority and I am already here. Renew your relationship with me, and that's going to take us to this beautiful life. But it has to be more than what we just say with our lips. We have to get uh, our life in action to do the things that will honor God. I had a friend in Bethesda by the name of Rich Lotus. She was the headmaster at Sidwell's Middle School in Bethesda. And he once told me that he asked a third grader, what do you want for the world? And the third grader said, I want peace and every child to be fed. No hunger. He said, great. And what do you want for yourself? And the third grader said, I want a G.I. Joe with a grenade launcher and a swimming pool. <laughs> Somehow, his desires and actions didn't match up to what he said were the priorities. If our priorities are to be restored in a full relationship with God, then the ways of God must become central to our life. But it's not just getting restored to God. It says you also got to get restored to one another. Uh, and there's this beautiful description here. It, it, uh, it just touches me. It makes me feel warm. He says that I see a day where, where there's going to be old folks sitting in the street. They got their canes there. They're sitting and they're chatting. They're talking. They're playing checkers, whatever they're doing. They're all there in the street. And running around their feet are boys and girls. There's just boys and girls everywhere running. Now, you know why this was such a great vision? Because when they came back from exile, the old folks didn't come. They couldn't come. It took three months to walk from Babylon to Jerusalem, if you had pretty good weather. Three months. How many of you would walk for three months to go anywhere? Uh, right there, one person. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'd walk maybe two days and they'd have to, you know. Last uh, Saturday, I walked for an hour on the Appalachian Trail and I needed oxygen. I mean, it almost wasn't quite that bad, but I wouldn't be able to walk three months. Come on. So the old folks just stayed in Babylon. They just died in Abel. And if the women who were great with child, nope, <laughs> I'm not making that walk either. So they stayed in Babylon. So when they began to rebuild the city, 
city, there were no old folks and there were very few children. There was just nobody there. And God says, listen, but I'm going to bring it back. There's going to be a day when the, the whole village is back together. Now, I was told not to play in the streets, so I want to make sure this is clear in case there is a child listening. Uh, they weren't really sitting in the street. They were sitting in the village square, the plaza. They were sitting where people congregated to get together to check on one another and to ask about the family and to, to laugh together and maybe to cry together and, and, and to be at one together. The community was coming back together. The pandemic alienated and separated us. Uh, not a person here that didn't have some effect by that. And you probably are reading that that businesses cannot get their employees to come back in. Have you seen that? Uh, it's very difficult to get folks to come back in the office. It's not just in the businesses, it's everywhere. I don't know what happens to us as individuals, but if you give us a lot of time on our own, it gets harder and harder to be around people. Have you noticed that? I don't know what that's about. Some of you who study the human nature can tell me. Uh, it's just harder. And so here we are, we, we were forced into kind of isolation, and, and the groups that were isolated the most were children and teenagers and older adults because they were the most vulnerable. And so everybody's homeschooling and, and the adults can't leave the house, and if they're in a nursing home or assisted living, they got to lock down. My mother went a full year without seeing anybody except people standing outside her window and waving at her and talking on the phone. It was the only way she could see folk because because the pandemic had isolated us. But now, uh, we, we, schools are going, things are happening, folks are even going to the movies. Uh, I went to an Oriole game a few weeks ago. There were so many people there, I couldn't believe it. Uh, fighting the traffic and all that kind of thing to see a, a, a baseball game. Uh, that's coming, the, things are waking up. And so, uh, it's time for us to renew our relationship with one another. To, to see one another again, to sit with one another again, to share our stories, to share our concerns, to pray together, uh, to, to shed a tear and shed a laughter. It's time for us to come back and renew our relationship to one another. Now, certainly, our older members who are very vulnerable, they, they, people with illnesses and underlying conditions, no, I'm not trying to get anybody to come back here who would be a health risk, but I don't think everybody's staying out there. I'll talk to the cameras now. I don't think everybody out there today is out there just because of health reasons. Anybody here believe that? I, I think we get out of the habit, we get out of the, uh, the motion, we get a little bit lazy, we, we get all these things going, we reinvest in other things, and the church kind of goes down the track. Plus, you can hear this music and this sermon in your PJs with a cup of cocoa in your hand. Now, if you want to wear your PJs, come on back to church, we don't care. Just wear your PJs, and uh, maybe we need to get cup holders. Let's have the trustees look into that. Uh, cup holders, and we'll serve tea and coffee and cocoa, whatever we got to do. Just come on back, because you need to know each other. There's going to be lots of opportunities. We have Children's Church right now. Uh, Reverend Carol Ramsey Lucas, she's prepared every week. She does a lot of work, but she can't teach children without children, so bring the children back. Bring the children back. And, and not all of our older members can risk coming back, but we could reach out to them. We can let them know how valuable they are, how important and special they are. And many of them now can receive visitors. They don't want to be in a group of people, but they can receive a visitor one-on-one. -on -one. Reach out to them. Say hello. Let them know that they are very, very important. And the rest of us, we just need to come together and get to know one another again and renew our commitment to one another. You are very special people. You are very, very special people. And uh, we need to know one another. We need you. Uh, this fall, there's going to be some new classes, one on helping people raise adult children, if you've ever tried to do that. Oh, I just about broke into tears right there. How do you raise and guide adult children? That's tough. We're going to have a class on that. We're going to have a class on Bible 
books of the Bible and other things. So look for those and get involved. Some will be online, some will be in person. Get involved in something like that. It'd be good for you, I promise you. Uh, there'll be those things. We're going to have a cookout in September. It'll be safe. It'll be outdoors. We'll get all the food sanitary. It'll be fine, I promise. It, but it'll give us a chance to say hello and to get to know one another a little bit better, renew our relationships. And, and then we have service possibilities. Football parking is a great time to get to know people. We'll be delivering our, our baskets or other things in the holidays. Uh, I was told last week that I said there was nothing for us to do with warm nights. I was corrected in that. There are things we can do. We just don't shelter folks anymore. Uh, get involved with the ministry, the mission, the Bible study. Hey, you know what? In, in December, we're going to be able to celebrate the birth of Christ together for the first time in three years. Three years. Come, see one another, love one another, talk one another. Be together, renew our relationship to each other, and then renew our relationship to hope. Uh, there's such a beautiful passage here. God says, you may think this is impossible because it's impossible for you, but it's not impossible for me. Not impossible for me. I can do this. I just need you to participate. I can do it. I can rebuild it. And then he says something that must have seemed like music to these folks' ears. He says, I'm back in Jerusalem. I'm waiting on you. We can do this together. For you are my people, and I am your God. I don't know if you remember, but when we began this sermon series Redeemed to rebuild, we read Haggai in the first two verses of his prophecy. God says, thus saith the Lord, why do these people say it's not time to rebuild the temple of the Lord? Why do these people, and it broke their heart. It just broke their heart. God had never referred to them as these people. These people. But they were so far away and they were so broken and they were so disrespectful to God. God said, I, I don't even recognize them anymore. But now here we made it to the eighth chapter of Zechariah. And Zechariah says, God looks out and says, and you shall become my people. And I shall be your God. We'll be back together. Reconciled. You can't reconcile by yourself. You just can't do it. If you love somebody who does not love you back, you become a martyr and they become an abuser or a manipulator or an enabler. It's not a good situation. God says, I love you with a holy passion. I need you to love me back. I need you to be my people. I'm going to be your God. And we will be restored and live the beautiful life. You just got to hope you got to hope. I know it looks dismal at times. you just got to keep hope going and stay with it, and I will honor that hope. And then lastly, God says, all these things will happen as well as uh, there will be prosperity in the fields, and uh, you'll be a blessing, and joy will be abound in the community, he says. All this will happen, but you got to get your hands strong. That means you got to go to work. He says it twice. Make your hand strong. Make your hand strong means you got to work. There are specific things we have to do. We have to roll up our sleeves and rebuild so much of our life together. God says when you do that, then you will have that beautiful life. Raymond Barfield is one of these people that I feel some jealousy for because he's accomplished oh, so much. Maybe I have envy. Uh, or maybe I just feel embarrassed next to people like this. <laughs> Raymond Barfield is a, a Ph.D. and a medical doctor. He taught at Washington and Lee. He taught at Duke. His specialty is children with terminal cancer. Not a great, fun job, but he's dedicated his life to that. He's worked at it. He's, he's doctored. Uh, in addition to that, he also got a degree in theology and philosophy because he wanted to give spiritual guidance to so many people that were working in this very difficult field. And beyond that, he wrote a best-selling novel and a book of poetry. This guy needs to take a break, doesn't he? Uh, but when asked, how do you get so much done in life? He said this, I think of each day as a gold coin that you are required to trade for something. You'll never get that coin back. 
So whatever you trade for it had better be worth it. You also don't know how many coins you have left to trade. What do you want to spend the coins you have left on? I know there are other things beyond the church. I'm not confused. Lots of things desire, you, know, you have to give your coins to. But it's going to take reinvestment of energy and sacrifice. It's going to take work to rebuild the community of faith. We can do it. You can do it. We all can do it if we keep the hope. If we restore our relationship with God, if we restore our relationship to one another, if we restore our relationship to hope, and if we restore our relationship to work, God bless this community in powerful ways. There's a guy named Rich Cohen that writes about his uh, growing up days. And when he was eight years old, the family moved from Bro Brooklyn, New York, to Chicago. And he was devastated. They moved into this big old drafty house. It was paint was peeling. And when, literally when the wind blew, the doors rattled and the windows rattled. And it, all the appliances were out molded or broken. And, and the decor looked like something from another generation. And to make all that worse, the Cohen family was the only Jewish family in the neighborhood. And he went to his mother and he said, why did you do this to me? <laughs> I had a beautiful life back in Brooklyn. Why did you do this to me? Why did you bring me here? And she said, Richie, you wait and see. One day this house is going to be a mansion. And he said, I waited 15 years, and the house was still drafty, <laughs> and the yard was still a mess, and it was hard to keep it painted. He said, it never was a mansion. But it was the place where all my birthdays were held. And it was the place where all our holidays were observed. And it was the place that my relatives came, and my little league team came, and my first date when I sat on the sofa and watched TV, nervous as I could be. It was a place of joy and tears. It was the place of all these experiences. And this is what he finished his little writing by saying. 1062 Bluff Road in Chicago, Illinois, ended up being the only place I have ever felt at home. It's where my mind goes back when I feel sick, mistreated, sorry for myself, or lonely. I dream I am back in that house at least once a month, a house where I had a beautiful life. This building may not look like much. <laughs> it's a little drafty, a little broken, a little run down. But I'm telling you, it is the place that three generations go back to, to remember when they walked with God, when they were baptized, when they were married, when they could run through the pews, when they had vacation Bible school, when they had passport trips. And it's not the building they remember. It's not the curtains. It's not the, it's not the carpeting. It, it, it's not anything in this structure or any, and it will never be those kinds of things. It is you they remember. I have three sons that grew up here. I have a fourth son who is still here. I have a daughter that grew up here. When I ask them about their faith, it's people, they say. It is people people they remembered, that they sat in the pews with, that they went to passport with, that they laughed in the foyer with, that they played in the nursery with. It is the people of God's faith who came together to raise my kids, and they will always think of this place as their spiritual home. It's so important that we renew our relationship with God and each other in hope and work to rebuild this community of faith God's promised us that God will be with us to do so. And if you don't remember, you don't believe me yet, hear this as a final. This email came in this morning. Hello, Pastor John. Happy Sunday. I pray you and your family are doing well. I am writing to send greetings to you in the church. We think of you often in our prayers, and we endlessly count the blessings that you are to us. School's going well, few challenges for sure, 
But raising little humans is even harder. The Lord is strengthening us as we are moving forward. May God bless you and keep you all in the palm of his hands. Hoping to hear from you soon and God willing that we will get to visit there again. Blessings. Isabella Mona Calum. I get an email like this virtually once a week from somebody somewhere that says, I will always remember the church as a special blessing in my life. May we continue to be for one another now and unto all future generations by God's grace. Amen.